Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Raising the Bar and today is an absolutely groundbreaking um, and yeah, explosive interview um, and this is with a gentleman here called Zachary King. How are you doing, Zach? Doing well, thank you. Um, now, this is a, an incredible story because this is where you got into Satanism and you actually became a high wizard in this and uh, you're going to tell your story about how you got into it uh, and all the things that happened around that. And then you actually found Catholicism and you found sort of savior with that. And this is an incredible story. Um, really sit back and, you know, get get your cup of tea on for this one, guys, because uh, this is uh, <laughs> your, or a cup of coffee in America, wherever you are. I know tea is an English thing, but uh, but yeah, this is, this is going to be a real knockout um, chat we're going to have here. And so, Zach, if it's OK with you, my friend, would you mind telling the story about how it started um, at school and your, your first sort of baby steps into the satanic world. Sure. Uh, um, you know, I started off first watching every horror movie that existed. I loved horror films. And the scarier, the better. And it was hard finding a scary movie. You know, it, I grew up, and I was born in 66. So my exam, my, my look into horror movies back then was, Boris Karloff and Vincent Price, which aren't really horror movies. You know, they're more science fiction and a little schlocky. But you know, I, I got into that, and some of the horror movies they practice magic, and in their magic, people could levitate, and I associated that with superheroes because superheroes can levitate. Superman flies; that's levitation. So I thought if I could figure out how to do that and I could levitate my way to school I'd be the coolest kid at school <laughs> so it became that started off I had a burning desire to do something that no one else could do mm -hmm. now I asked my Baptist preacher and my parents is magic real is that something you can really do and both told me no magic's not real you know that, that's just th something of Hollywood. Somehow my parents and my Baptist preacher missed the 33 verses in the Bible where God tells you not to do magical things. Now, why would God tell you not to do something if it was impossible to do? Mm -hmm. Like if you couldn't lie, thou shalt not lie wouldn't be in the Ten Commandments. Yeah, true. If it was impossible to kill somebody, thou shalt not kill wouldn't be in there. If it was impossible to do magic, there wouldn't be 33 verses in the Bible that told you not to do it. Good point. So yeah, they missed those. I had read the whole Bible by then, so I didn't know. Mm. And I, I just, I wanted magic to work. And I set about to first find a magic spell to do. What kind of magic spell that I want. Now, I get a weekly quiz every Friday. And if I break my teacher's leg and she's out, they'll replace her with somebody else that might be worse. Mm. I'm a little fat, nerdy kid. I don't like PE. And my PE coach, yeah, it'd be nice to send them home for a month or two. But, you know, they're not going to leave us alone. Yeah. We'll get another PE coach. Mm. And that guy could be worse. So I'll just stick to the people I got. But what kind of spell could I do that would confirm that magic works? I thought a spell for money. Somebody loses some cash. I find some cash. Yeah, yeah, this works. So I did a spell for money. And I found a can of tennis balls with a $5 bill in it. Now, this is 1976. Comic books are 15 to 20 cents. Candy bars are 15 to 20 cents. Any candy is a penny. Mm. These are the three things that mean the most to me. So five bucks, I can get quite a bit. You know, I can get, what, 20 candy bars for that, you know, or even the penny candy. Mm. I can get 500 pieces. So I'm thinking that's pretty good. Now, at the same time as I'm looking into magic spells, on the first day of the fifth grade, this kid came up to me and he said, meet me in the bathroom at the first break. 
Well, we don't have the internet back then. We don't have warnings. No teacher. My parents never told me, if somebody tells you to meet them in the bathroom, don't go. No one ever said that. So 10, 20, I, I'm in the bathroom. There's about 50 kids in there, girls and boys in the same bathroom. And they say, we're going to turn out the lights, chant a phrase 11 times. And if you do it right, the spirit of a burn victim will show up in the mirror. You know, I'm thinking, mm. okay, this, I don't know. I've never seen this in a movie. I've never seen this in a cartoon. I've never heard anybody talk about it. But if you say this will work, I'm willing to try it. So they turned out the lights. Now we're all apprehensive because we're only 10 years old. And some of us are still scared of the dark. And we chant the phrase. And the scary face shows up. And 49 kids bolted from the bathroom. One child, he's an idiot. I can call him an idiot because it was me. Decided this is the coolest thing in the world. I chanted this phrase 11 times. I made this face appear. Now, something I'd like to bring up here is that if you're looking in the mirror and you're seeing a face looking back at you, that's not some far off distant land that you've managed to tap into with the mirror. And it's not even the room on the other side of the mirror. If you're seeing somebody's face reflected back at you, they're standing next to you mm. and you're seeing their reflection. Right. But I wasn't smart enough to figure that out. I just thought spirit of a burn victim. I don't know where they are, you know, and it looked like a burn victim. They had very dark, uh, shiny skin and their face looked like it had melted. There was skin going from above their mouth that stretched to covering their mouth and um, very sharp teeth. And I didn't realize I was looking at a demon. And eventually, so many kids played this that kids got hurt. I don't mean bumps and bruises. I mean, broken arm, broken leg hurt. Right. So notes were sent home. And that said, if we were caught playing this game at school, we'd be suspended for three days. Now, normally, I go into the den, give my dad this note. My dad takes it, signs it, throws it back at me, never reads it. This day, he decided he would read it. And he reads it, and his face contorts, and he's looking really mad. And, you know, my dad had been a sniper in the Marines and brought all the love that comes with that position to the house. And... He looked at me and in his usual loving tone said, have you been playing this game? <laughs> Being terrified of my dad that I was, I told him 100% truth. Nope. So I wouldn't get caught at school and get suspended and spend those three lovely days with my dad. Mm -hmm. I started playing the game at home. Ooh. But when I played it at school, I played it once a day. You know, because I didn't want to get caught. Now that I'm playing it at home, I wake up in the morning, I play the game. I go to the bathroom, I play the game. I wash my hands, I play the game. I brush my teeth, I play the game. I go out and I have breakfast, I come back. I wash my hands again, I play the game. I brush my teeth, I play the game. Before I leave for school, I've played the game 20 times. When I get home from school, my parents aren't home. So I'm playing the game another 30 times. So I'm playing it anywhere from 25 to 50 times a day. Every time I do it, same face shows up, doesn't talk to me, just floats there in the mirror. Now, it looks mm. bad or, or bad. or It doesn't look friendly. Yeah. But as a child, I gave it the, the law of bulldogs. Here's the law of bulldogs. Bulldogs are one of the friendliest animals in the world. They are also one of the ugliest. They can't help that face. They were born with that face. Mm. Maybe that thing in the mirror, maybe it was born with that face. Yeah. He, he didn't control. I didn't control the face I got when I was born. Yeah. Neither did he. And maybe he's not a bad guy. Mm. So I'm doing that. Now, same time as those two things are going on, I'm also playing campaigns of Dungeons and Dragons every and I'm always the sorcerer or the magician, the wizard in that. 
And after a while, I noticed that when I roll the die for, say, light or food or, but it, but it's on the level of anybody else. I'm going to roll between a one and a 15 pretty much every time. Mm -hmm. But if I'm rolling for magic, I roll 16 to 20 every single time. My magic spells always work because you need between a 16 and a 20 for the magic spell to work. Oh, really? And I always do that. So I, I'm I'm pretty happy with that, but it took me years to realize that. And so when I was, um, there was also, there was a kid that used to play with us when we were 10. Mm. And then he stopped coming to school and stopped going to church and stopped playing D&D, &D, stopped hanging out with us. So we thought he moved. And when I was 11 years old, I became the victim of a sexual assault at school at the hands of a female teacher. Now she told me it was my idea. I wanted to do it and I enjoyed it. And that if I told anybody that I'd be expelled from school, I'd be arrested and go to prison. I would be disinherited by my parents. And that when I got out of prison, which they made it sound like I would get out the same year, I wouldn't be allowed to go back to school. I'd have to get a job at 11 years old and not be allowed to go to school and not live at home, I have to pay for my own rent and, you know, do everything on my own. Mm. She's a teacher. Why would you lie to me? So I just went back home and went back to doing whatever I did. But the, the problem was at that time, I'd been a victim of a sexual assault. Yeah. And the only thing that gave me comfort and solace was more magic. So mm. I dove further into magic. When I was 12 years old, I met this kid that had used to play D&D &D with us. It's the kid that disappeared for a while. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that he was still there. It, he was being homeschooled. Oh. He stopped going to church mm -hmm. and he was, you know, taking classes at home. And what it turned out he was a satanic recruiter, but I wouldn't have known what that was at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, he was 12 years old, same as me. And he told us about this group that plays D&D &D every weekend. And they also believe that magic is real. Well, I know magic is real. You know, because I did the magic spell and found five bucks. Mm -hmm. Then I did another magic spell the next weekend and found 10 bucks. And then the next weekend, I did it one more time. And... I, but I, I, I did it in the bathroom at home. So when I was halfway into the spell, I did the Bloody Mary chant. And when the face showed up, I let it know I was doing a spell for magic and for money. And the next day I went out and I found $1,000. Mm -hmm. You know, it, was, it looked like Monopoly money rolled up tight in rubber bands. And it looked like Monopoly money because I'd never seen a $100 bill. So I've got 10 $100 bills. And now I know that magic is real. Mm -hmm. I have knowledge that parents don't have and that the Baptist preacher don't have. You know, and do you think I went and told them they were wrong and magic works? No. Mm -hmm. I kept that little secret to myself. Mm -hmm. That's a little gem of knowledge. Now I can do something that parents can't do and my Baptist preacher can't do. Not only can they not do it, they don't think it's possible to do it. So I've got a thousand dollars. I can go spend this on anything I want. I mean, if I, if I just bought candy, I could get a hundred thousand pieces of penny candy. <laughs> you know, you know, one of the things I did do is that I went out and I bought Kiss Alive too. You know, and I bought Alice Cooper's Greatest Hits. Mm -hmm. And in the eighties, I bought this band. It was called Six Six Butneck. It was a punk band, and. You know, I, I was buying just anybody that I could find. And my parents didn't pay any attention to the stuff that I bought because they didn't realize I was buying it new. They thought that I was taking a little bit of money that I earned here and there and went to Goodwill and just bought. It was there. You could buy an album for 10 cents, you know, or sometimes a double album for a quarter. 
yeah. uh, books for 10 cents, comic books for 10 cents, mm. you know, boots for maybe a quarter, a jacket, like a leather jacket for a dollar. But no, you know, and they didn't really. <laughs> They didn't realize that what I was buying was new. You know, that I had a thousand dollars and I could buy whatever I wanted. You know, to put that in perspective, also for the people that are listening, back in the 1970s, thousand dollars had the buying power of seven thousand dollars now. So, you know, it, it's a decent amount of money to find. So, I find I start hanging out with this group that this kid told me about, you know, at my house, we have a 26 inch console TV. Now for people that aren't as old as me, a console TV is a big, thick TV screen that's put in a big wooden box. Mm -hmm. And it's used like a piece of furniture. I have to shine that and dust it every weekend. And, um, you know, there's usually flowers or something on top of it to make it look nice. And it's like a piece of furniture. You know, it's not like my, my TV now hangs on the wall. You know, I've got a 65 inch. Mm. And we, we didn't have 65 inch TVs back then. So my parents have a 26 inch. Um, and at my house, you can watch a lot of G-rated movies, so a lot of Disney, mm. and a PG-rated movie if it had been vetted by my dad first. I didn't know there were movies that were rated R, but over at this place, you could watch an R-rated movie, or you could watch an X-rated movie, mm. or you could watch a triple X-rated movie, or you could watch a triple X-rated movie with kids in it my age and younger. I didn't know that existed. Mm. There were movies, there were VHS, there were loops, and there were still vids and still pictures and all of this of child pornography. But it wasn't called child pornography. It was just called movies. Mm. And they told me that what happened to me when I was 11 was horrible. That should have never happened to anybody. But now's the chance I can get my power back. Now, if I want to, I can sleep with whoever I want. Nobody can tell me no. And if anybody wants to sleep with me and I don't want to do it, I can tell them no. So I have all the power to do whatever I want at this point. And, you know, so, and they said that they'd make me famous. So they put me in child pornography. I was in that from 12 to 16 and a half. And at 16 and a half, I grew a mustache and I kind of aged out of porn. But, we would have people write to us. They would use um, notebook paper that a child would use and sometimes write in crayon and describe, like all of us had, if you watch the, mo the movies that we were in, it would show a picture of us and have our acting name. So my acting name was Tommy. So it would show my name as Tommy. And then we had, everybody else had their own name, but none of the names are real. You don't use your real name in these things. Yeah. And so people would write in and say, hey, we'd like to see the, the dark kid because most of the kids in these videos are white hmm. and I'm a little Hispanic kid. So they would request the little Hispanic kid or the dark kid. Uh, Tommy, could we see him on screen acting with? And they'd name some other girl they wanted to see me act with. But because it was written in crayon, on young child paper, we just assumed it was children that were watching the movies. Because whenever we watched the movies, it was a room full of kids watching porn. You know, it was no big deal. There were never any adults in there unless the adult was changing out the video for us. It didn't occur to us that adult pedophiles were watching this. We didn't know what pedophiles were. I don't even know that, that word was used. Hmm. But, you know, we, we didn't know that existed. We didn't know that grown adults would watch this stuff and be interested. We just knew that we were kids, so it must be kids writing in. Mm. So 
I learned that before a meal, before, let's say you've already eaten today. Now you're being faced with a huge meal, but you don't have room in your stomach to eat it. Mm -hmm. So smoke a couple of joints first. You get the munchies, then you can eat anything. Or, you know, after you eat a meal, after you eat a big meal, smoke a cigarette. Or after a big meal, especially of beef, um, smoke a cigar. You know, while you're eating, maybe drink some wine. Um, after you've ate, take a couple of shots. Um, while you're relaxing, watching a football game, maybe drink a beer. Mm. You know, I had like, there was a thing called a fruit salad and a salad bowl. Salad bowl had thousands of different pills in it. And none of them are labeled. You just stick your hand in there and take one or two and see what happens. So some things make things brighter. Some things make them slow down. Mm -hmm. Some things make you speed up. Some of them make you hot. Some make you cold. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, it could be anything. You might hallucinate. Mm -hmm. You know, you might pass out. But, you know, you're going to see what happens because you don't know. Um, you know, I found out that I love to smoke pot. And I love to take acid and I love to take MDMA doing MDMA and acid at the same time is called candy flipping. And I love to do that. It was my favorite thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And I remember too, that during this time I'm 12 years old and my dad had told me my entire life that drugs kill you. No matter what it is, drugs will kill you. Mm -hmm. Marijuana will kill you. The first time you smoke it, it could kill you. The first time you pop a pill, it can kill you. No matter what you're doing, it will kill you. Well, I, I smoked a joint and nothing happened. It just got high. You know, and I, I popped a pill and things got brighter. Things got darker. You know, even if I passed out, I woke up. You know, I'm taking drugs every day. And I don't die from any of this stuff. So, like, did my dad not know? Or was my dad lying to me? He told me you never want to take your first drink because you might be an alcoholic. I drank all the time and I wasn't an alcoholic. I could stop all the time. Yeah. You know, I got drunk a lot before class. If I didn't have any booze, I didn't drink. It didn't bother me. I would just drink whenever I had it. Mm. You know, I, I got probably addicted to masturbation and sex and pornography. Mm. And... You know, my dad had never told me that anything like that existed. And this kid, when I'm 12 years old, this older kid ran up to me and he says, you know, you're in a satanic coven, right? And he took off running. And I laughed it off. You know, I've seen Rosemary's Baby and I've seen The Exorcist and I've seen other creepy movies. Hmm. And I don't know if you remember, um, we used to have the Batman series here. It started Adam West as Batman. Yeah, we had that. And that was in the 60s. Okay. Well, when Batman is on the screen, Batman is straight up and down. He's upright because he's just and honest. But when the Joker or the Penguin or the Catwoman or the Riddler is on the screen, the screen is tilted because these guys are the bad guys. They're crooks. They're crooked. So there's good guys I mean, I get to eat whatever I want. If I want pizza for dinner every night. I get pizza for dinner every night. If I want to live on Snicker bars and potato chips all day, I can do that. If I just want a box of donuts and a glass of milk, I can have that. If I want to smoke a joint and drink a beer and go to a movie, I can do that. You know, whatever it is that I want to do, I'm allowed to do it. Who's the good guy again? Who's the bad guy? I mean, in my life, my dad, who I associate with God, is the no police. In the Bible is full of thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Tell me where in the Bible he says you can do something. Where is there permission in there? Because I, I didn't see permission as a child. 
I just saw here's 10,000 things you're not allowed to do. You know, when he gets done giving you that long list, what's left that you're allowed to do? I, I don't see anything. And then when my dad, dad, there's uh, the Moody Blues coming to town. Can I go see him? No. Dad, there's a new movie opening Friday. Can I go? No. Dad, there's a new play at the school. Can I? No. Hmm. Dad, no. And eventually you just look at my dad. No. Everything I wanted to do was a bad idea. Everything I wanted to do, I was told no. Now, my dad didn't give me alternatives. He didn't say, we're not going to do that. This is okay. Mm -hmm. He just shut me down across the board. So I got to give you a warning here. You know, parents out there, you're listening to this. Don't shut your kids down because Satan is waiting for you to walk away and he'll pick you, he'll take your kid by the hand and walk him into whatever sin he wants to show them. You know, and it'll be your fault for deciding that you wanted to keep them safe from everything. You know, and as a result, Satan's going to give them everything he wants to give them, which is everything you won't. Um, so I went up to a kid after a couple of weeks. It kind of bothered me that this kid said it was a satanic coven. I mean, I've seen people come over late at night and they're dressed in black robes. And I've seen satanic movies where people are dressed in black robes. But these people were friendly to me. Mm. You know, this, this guy came in, gave me $5 for no reason, gave me a candy bar. Mm. Who's, who's the bad guy here? My dad who won't give me the candy bar and won't give me five bucks? Or this guy? Now, I was Baptist. In the Baptist church, they taught us that Jesus defeated the devil on the cross 2,000 years ago. So he's no threat now. And the devil is afraid of the Baptist church. So hmm. if the devil is afraid of me, Maybe the devil's giving me everything I want so I don't hurt him. But I have no idea how I would do that. You know, uh, you know, according to the Baptist church, Jesus defeated him on the cross, so he's no threat. So um, I, not, I'm not getting all the nuances here of what's going on. I just know that my, my dad and supposedly my God tell me no for everything I want to do. And Satan tells me yes for everything I want to do. Yeah. And again, let me ask, who's the bad guy? Who's the good guy? Hmm. You know, my dad says he does what's good for me. Do you really? Because not from where I'm standing. I don't get to do anything that I want to do. Not everything I want to do has to be bad. There's no way every single thing I say is bad. So, or bad for me. Yeah. So after a couple of weeks, though, I was kind of bothered by, you know, hey, you know, you're in a satanic coven, right? So I went up to a, a member that I trusted, this older guy, and I said, hey, you're going to laugh. I heard this was a satanic coven. Crazy, right? I expected him to burst out laughing, pat me on the back and send me on my way. Hmm. But instead he said, it is. And my heart went bloop, right into my stomach. And I was like, am I a member? No. Would you like to be? Right. Now see, I've got people that come to my talks and they're like, didn't you know right from wrong? Or don't you have a well-formed conscience? Didn't you know Satan's the bad guy? Well, no, I don't know Satan's the bad guy. I'm having sex almost every night. I'm definitely having sex on the weekends when they film me and put me into movies. I'm famous. People are writing into me that are seeing these movies, and now they want to see me in a new movie with a different actress and see us do certain acts together. Yeah. I'm having the time of my life. I'm getting to get drunk when I do that. I'm on drugs all the time. I can do anything I want. I can go see. I went and saw the Moody Blues in concert. I went and saw Kit. My first, my first act that I got to see was Ted Nugent 
opening for Kiss. Mm. And I thought, this is the most awesome show in the world. You know, it's original four band members, all the makeup, all the costumes, Gene Simmons breathing fire and spitting blood. You know, Paul Stanley coming out there and smashing his guitar. Uh, Peter Chris on the drum, the drum kit moves all over the stage. And I'm thinking, this is the most awesome show ever. You know, there's smoke and lights. And, Mm. you know, it's like I was an impressionable 12 year old. You know, we got to go backstage and meet the band, you know, and, you know, didn't I know right from wrong? Well, no, apparently I didn't, you know, but the lines were blurred by my God and my dad deciding to say no to everything. Mm. So I, you know, I was like, um, you know, and, and thinking about if I left, because that's what I looked at. If I left, what would I lose? So I am addicted to porn. I'm addicted to pornography. I'm addicted to masturbation. Mm. I'm addicted to sex. If I leave, I'm going to lose all that. I'm not going to have sex because this coven is the ones that you know are putting out the kitty porn stuff. And I'm in that 12 years old. I'm starring in movies. I'm going to lose that. You know, and, and you got to be 18 years old to buy porn. Mm. I'm 12. You know, you got to be 19 to buy cigarettes and cigars. I'm still 12. You got to be 21 to buy booze. I'm still 12. So if I quit, I can't drink anymore. I can't smoke. I can't do um, drugs. I can't because I get them here. I can't eat whatever I want, whenever I want, because all the candy and chips and pizza are here. You know, I don't have any of that at my house. You know, I lose all my sex rights and I'm enjoying all that. And all that is here. If I lose, if I leave here, I lose everything. And I'm liking everything. Yeah. Satan has me hooked. You know, Satan has me right where he wants me. And I, I don't want to leave. Can uh, I can I ask how, I how did you know it was Satan at that point? Because you 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 didn't really have an understanding of it at that young age, did you? Or or did you feel as though there was actually a demonic um connection to everything you were doing? Well, the kid had said, you know, you're belong you belong to a satanic coven. Yeah. So he told me it was a satanic coven. Um, but yeah, you know, and when they were confirming that, you know, it is a satanic coven, then it didn't take much, you know, to put that together that, oh, mm-hmm. this is Satan. Church on Sunday, that's God. Mm-hmm. And this is the opposite guy. Right. But Satan didn't seem like the bad guy. You know, Satan gives me everything I want. God tells me no. Mm. Mm. You know, and as a kid, Mm. you don't equate what's best for you as being the good guy. You equate what's given to you as being the good guy. Yes. You know, so if somebody comes up to you and in a nice way gives you poison, and somebody else is making you eat vegetables, there's a good chance you're going to go for the poison because mm. it's nice. Tastes like chocolate. Why yeah, not eat it? He's friendly to you. Mm. Your parents are mean, gruff. They yell at you. They make you do your homework. They make you eat all your vegetables. They make you come home at a certain time. Mm. You know, you've got so many rules. It feels so oppressive. Mm. You know, and the devil's not oppressive. So, you know, I said, what's involved in me joining? He said, well, there's 13 steps to becoming a Satanist. And you've done almost all of them already. All you have left to do is to slice your left thumb, left because it's closest to your heart, yeah. and bleed onto a document. It's a five-page document. 
and you have to sign it in three places in your blood. The blood of Jesus washes away all sin, but not mine. Jesus died for everybody, but not me. And on the final page, you agree to sell your soul to the devil. Now, at this point during my talks, I'll say, how many people believe you can sell your soul to the devil? And usually it's about a 50-50 split. You know, even if I've got 18,000 people in the audience, half of those people believe they can sell their soul to the devil. And I'm here to tell you, it's impossible to sell what you don't own. God died for you. Jesus paid the ultimate price for your soul. You don't own it. You can't loan it. You can't lease it. And you certainly can't sell it. I'm here to confirm, though, that Satan is a liar. If Satan says, good morning, get a second opinion. You can't trust anything he says. Mm. What you have done is given your will to the devil. All you have to do to give your will back to God is go to confession. Now, you might need an exorcism or a deliverance afterwards, but at the very least, you need to go to confession. You need to give that will back to God and take it away from the devil. Now, on your deathbed, he'll be telling you that he'll see you in hell in a couple of minutes and that you know he owns your soul. He's lying to you because he wants you to feel despair. You know, but if you're within the sound of my voice and you're hearing this interview, mm -hmm. you cannot sell your soul. It is impossible for you to sell something that you don't own. Mm -hmm. So, but at 13 years old, when I signed this document, and, you know, all 13-year-olds know it all, um, I knew that what I was doing, I was selling my soul to the devil. And I wasn't even sure that hell was real. You know, or that some of the people in this group didn't believe Satan was real. Mm. Oh, really? You know, that belong to the group because they can do whatever they want. Right. So, but, you know, and then you have to, um, you sign that like the night before. Then you come to a satanic coven meeting and pretty much the whole coven is there. It's about a 150 members. And you're wearing a white robe, and it signifies losing your innocence. Uh, they put you in a vat. It looks like um, a demon skull head, and it's filled with human blood, pig's blood, and human urine. And they submerge you, full submersion, bring you back up. So you're baptized in that. You go into another room and take a shower. And when you come out, you're dressed in a black robe with the cowl raised up. And that signifies you've been baptized into a world of darkness. Then you sit in a chair. They hand you a crucifix that's inside of a giant wheel. So it's, it's about this big. Mm. And you, you spin the crucifix upside down, signifying human sacrifice. You put your arms, you put your hands on the arms of the crucifix and they read the document, and then you break the arms downward, denouncing Christ. What you're left with looks like a peace sign. And then they take the document and intertwine it with that. And they say, this is going to go into a vault and be there until you die. And you're eventually going to go to hell. And then you have a big sex orgy to celebrate that you're now a Satanist. And most people get a black robe at this point. And it's a black robe with a red inverted pentagram. But the robe that I wanted was the red robe with a black inverted pentagram. And it meant that I was the official mage, the official magic person of the, um, of the coven. Oh, and um, so now I was an official coven member and did all the magic for them. Um, I was just delving further into magic and learning all that I could. And then when I was 14 years old, um, this guy gave me a ball of Play-Doh and a scalpel. And he told me to practice stabbing this, that I was going to be performing 
an abortion in about nine months. Mm. I was like, cool. And then I went home and looked up the word abortion in the dictionary because I didn't know what it meant. Mm. Tea. <laughs> and you mentioned coffee. Are oh, you on tea, I'm, <laughs> I'm drinking tea. Good man. Um, so then we had a sex orgy that was all the male members 12 to 15 and a female member that was 19. Her position within the coven is a breeder. Her mm -hmm. job is to get pregnant and go have abortions. Yeah, I've heard this. So what's that? Yeah, I've heard this from conversations I've had as well with a detective. He says um, they even have homeless women become breeders on the streets and then they go to these... Um, they give their babies away to these satanic groups. Um, so, right. Yeah. So, sorry, can I just ask, was that, is this, is everyone having sex with that one girl or is it guy on guy as well? Like, is it homosexuality as well? No, it's, um, for the most part, it was, um, well, for, for that event, it's all these guys are all having sex with this girl. Right. In the, child pornography i was in yeah. they had a uh, guy on guy and guy on girl and girl on girl and it was just all all a jumble again yeah, i'm 12 years old right right you know i, I didn't know that I, I wasn't actually attracted to um to girls at that point oh, right. you know and then being sexually assaulted when i was 11 yeah i thought girls were gross well, I'm not necessarily sure that I would call myself gay, but, mm. you know, I did it because in a way it was a job and it was a privilege, you know, as I get to have sex, it was thrilling, mm. but, you know, I wasn't taught that gay people, homosexuality was wrong. Mm. You know, I wasn't taught anything about homosexuality. Mm. My parents never talked. Gay was not a topic in our house. Yeah. You know, that wasn't anything we knew about. I knew that, in school, if you wanted to insult somebody, you'd call them a fag. But I didn't even know what a fag was. Mm. I, I didn't know. I knew it was an insulting term, but I didn't know what it meant. You know, I, I didn't know what I was really saying to somebody when I said it. You know, and all the kids said it. To, girls didn't usually. Girls are nice. But all the boys said it to all the other boys. Mm. And I don't know that any of us knew what it meant. Right. Now, if you ask them, hey, what's this mean? I don't know. Why'd you say it? Because everybody else says it. Right. Mm. So, and we weren't like, there wasn't like a boy in the group that was quote unquote gay. You know, that he only worked with boys. Yeah. You know, and, and he didn't act feminine. You know, it was just today you're working with this boy today you're working with this girl right. you know and pretty much every for the most part everything we did our first set of my first set of movies was i got to have sex with everybody there and then boys and girls just to see but who do you click with who do you like the best um and and i had two girls that i liked better than everybody else mm. And one of them actually was when I was, I think I was 16, she was 21, wow. but she still looked like she was 10 or 11. She'd been in child pornography since she was three or four. God. Now she's 21. She doesn't, she doesn't age. Mm. She still looks like she's this 10 year old girl. And as far as I know, people probably think she's 10 years old, not realizing that she's been doing this for 18 years. So she's of legal age having sex with a bunch of younger boys. Uh, and how do they get she looks like? And how, how were they getting roped into it? How were they kind of drawn into it, do you think? A lot of the kids back then were kidnapped from... And they weren't necessarily kidnapped. They were found in bus depots. 
like greyhounds, mm. uh, you'd see kids get off the bus looking around like they're lost. They've never been there. They're just trying to escape where they're coming from. And there would be satanic recruiters there asking them, are they hungry? Mm. Would you like to go someplace where you can sleep? Would you like to go someplace where no one's trying to hurt you? And yes, everybody wants that. And so they would pick them up, take them to one of these houses, one of these recruitment houses, and they would get to see all the other kids and they'd get to see what we all get to do. Mm. And then they get to make up their mind. Do you want to stay here and do this? You know, all these guys star in movies every weekend. You're fed, you're clothed. We buy you toys. We give you a place to stay. Mm. If you want education, we can get you education. Oh, wow. If you don't want any of that, then you're free to just be a kid. Mm. Except that you don't go back home. You're not allowed to go back home. And you'll probably be trafficked. You know, you'll start off with a place like us, mm. but then from there, you'll go off and be in other states or you might be in other countries. They tell you that. You know, and in some cases, in some cases, their life was probably better where they came from. Mm. In a lot of places, they're not. That's why, that's why they're running away. Well, you know, we have, a lot of SRA in this country, uh, satanic ritual abuse. Mm. And a lot of people like to claim that SRA is false. I know psychiatrists in the United States that only work with SRA victims. Mm. And they have over 100 clients. Yeah. And that's what keeps them alive in their business is their SRA victims. You know, and it's like satanic ritual abuse is as it implies. It's Satanists molesting and raping young children at a very young age, usually between zero and five. And then the kid compartmentalizes in their brain and they don't remember it happening until they get into their 20s or 30s, sometimes older. And then they start having dreams and they're nightmares and they can't figure out why am I dreaming about this man dressed in a Godzilla suit having sex with me? And it seems so realistic, mm. you know? And then after going to a few years of counseling, they realize that that really happened. It's not a dream. It's a, it's a memory. Yeah. You know, and realizing that their family was involved in Satanism. Now, I would say 90% of the cases I've had, it was their family that got them involved. I was going to say... So 10%, it was a random group. I was going to say the, the children that are born into those families, they're kept alive, tortured, but then kind of used as sort of maybe slaves or uh, they're programmed in a certain way. Uh, passed around maybe you know as sex objects but it's the children that are sort of abducted kidnapped they're used within those rituals and they're the ones that are killed aren't they To and you're going to talk about that that abortion story aren't you right how much detail do you want me to go into you can yeah as graphic as you want but as, as much as you you feel like you'd like to to tell the story but no holds barred you can say whatever you want you know as raw and okay. as authentic as you like <laughs> So, so I knew that you could get Satan's attention through abortion. So I started signing up to assist the abortion teams. And by doing that, I got to meet high wizards and I got to talk to them. And they told me that if I wanted to become a high wizard, you just keep signing up to assist the abortion teams. And maybe a few high wizards will make note of me. And that'll cause Satan to take notice. Mm. So I started doing that. I, I did about six abortions like that. And then pretty soon, it wasn't pretty, it was like three years almost. 
I was going to be turning 21 in 1987. And I got this notice just before my birthday that I was being called before the CEO and board of directors. And I know that sometimes when people get called for that, mm. they're never seen or heard from again. So I thought, you know, just to be on the safe side, I'm going to go buy a pistol and a lot of ammo. Mm. So I bought about 200 um, bullets, uh, bought a nine millimeter six hour and like 10 clips and bought a clip belt so I could have that inside my clothes and no one would know. But if they're going to start shooting at me, I'm going to shoot back. And um, I went to my meeting and they ushered me into a room. Uh, they sat me down in a plush leather chair. It was the CEO and some of the board of directors. And they asked me if I wanted to be the high wizard. And I thought about it. And they gave me this high wizard handbook. Mm. And when I opened that up, it says, first page, no one can tell you what to do. If somebody pays a million dollars to the coven to hire you, you don't have to do the magic spell. You can say no. You don't have to give a reason why. Mm. It's up to you. Magic spells you don't do don't count against you. Magic spells you do have 90 days to work. So all high wizards have to have um, a magic percentile of 90% or better. But you have three years to, if it drops below, you've got three years to bring, make it improve. And by the way, are you, are you feeling like you're still a good person at this point? Are you still thinking hey, there's nothing bad. All this is about is just getting the pleasures that I didn't get from when, I, when I was a kid and from my dad. You know, Do you still feel as though you're a benevolent what? person? Or do you feel like you moved into the dark side with this? I like to make people laugh. Mm. I still like to do that. Um, I thought I was still a funny guy. I didn't feel that I was the bad guy. Mm. I'm the high wizard. Everybody wants the high wizard. Everybody hires the high wizard. I mean, it takes a rock. It takes a high wizard to make a rock star. You know, I made twelve hundred rock stars from eighty-seven to ninety-nine. You know, if they had not been famous prior to eighty-seven, and you suddenly found somebody out that was famous in eighty-seven to ninety-nine, I made them famous. Now, some people re-sign a deal. They weren't happy with the deal they had, and they re-sign. Um, we had, um, I went to, it's called a warehouse deal. So there's warehouses in Hollywood and in Los Angeles. And I would show up with an entourage, mm. and you're, you walk in and you ask who wants to be famous. Everybody puts their hand up. Everybody wants to be famous. Mm. And I say, okay, what are you willing to do to be famous? You know, and the people that say I would do anything. Well, give me an example of anything. Well, nothing with animals or children, but anything else. So that person gets struck off the list. Wow. And Satan doesn't want the person that draws the line in the sand. He wants the person that's willing to jump in the mud and be drugged through it. So they write his name on the list and write down that he can't come back to one of these things for like 90 days. Or it might be for six months. If he's already tried a few times and every time he turns me down, he says nothing with animals or children, and this is the third time doing it, he might be told, don't come back for three years. Now, this person is never going to be famous because they have morals. 
there was a guy that came up to me, said he wanted to be famous. I said, what are you willing to do? He says, I'll do anything. Said, Give me an example of anything. He said, if you put me in a room with a horse and a naked three-year-old, I'm having sex with at least one of them. And I might have sex with both. All right. You're our boy. So I give him a, what's called a tier two card. It's a white card with a phone number. They call that number, do what they tell you. I'll see you on MTV in six months. This guy could not sing, could not dance, couldn't write a song, couldn't write a poem. And for some reason, there was a Dr. Seuss book in the room. And I said, read me that. And just before it rhymed, he closed the book and put it down and said, I don't get it. Like, you're going to be fun. So I gave him the phone number, sent him on his way. And now there's days I go in there, I talk to 100, maybe 300 people. And nobody says that they'll do absolutely anything. Too many people with morals and no rock stars that day. You know, a few years ago, Chester Bennington was with uh, Lincoln Park and Chris Cornell was with Soundgarden. He'd also been with Audio Slave. Mm -hmm. And they decided that they were going to reveal to the world the pedophile scandals that are happening within the music industry, hmm. which would have been this whole thing. Because the Illuminati is the one that sets up what you do. You have to agree to go to this hotel, do whatever they tell you to do. While you're in there, they film you and take still photos of it so they can blackmail you later hmm. inside, in case you decide to reveal something to somebody. And then, but if you're willing to do those things, I'll see you on MTV. So this guy that couldn't sing, dance, rhyme, anything, um, I saw him 90 days later singing and dancing in one of the two most popular boy bands of the 1990s. Can we say What's that? Can we can we say the name or not? How, how does that work then? Just just to quickly kind of um, get up to speed with it all. Like when you say that you'll see you on MTV in in three months. Like how did you know it was going to take that, that short amount of time? And is this happening just through networking processes whereby put this guy in? Like we're going to take this guy, just put him in. He can't sing, but just put him in. Or is it happening in more of a supernatural way and he, he's just like gifted with more of a singing voice and, and dancing skills just happening in the kind of the paranormal supernatural there's, quantum world? I don't know how you describe it. There's a spell that I was hired to do on multiple females. And it's it gives them a voice of a lot higher range than what, what they naturally have. All right. So they may have a range of two or three, two octaves that they can go up. Yeah. If I do this spell, this will give them six octaves. And, you know, there's not a whole lot of women that fall under that category. Yeah. But I have done spell work for four of them. And they can now hit notes that they couldn't hit before I did that for them. And that spell involves me going into the studio when they're singing. Mm pulling down the back of their pants and inserting my finger in their rectum. And I do a magic spell to go with it. It's not just a finger in the rectum, yeah. but in the rectum with the spell gives them that ability. And we found that spell in a, I think it was a Druid spell book mm -hmm. for improving somebody's singing voice. You know, there's um, almost everybody that's famous 
has agreed to sell their soul to the devil. It, basically, you sell your soul to the Illuminati, and right. the Illuminati makes you famous. But the Illuminati is a satanic coven. Really? So like here in the state. Yeah. You'd say that all the musicians that you see, the famous ones, they've all been kind of put through this kind of ritual. They've been gone through black magic. There's no exceptions. No, that there are exceptions. Right. There are. That how I knew who had sold their soul to the, the Illuminati and who hadn't. Every 90 days, we we're given a list of bands that are going to be in the same places we're going to be in. Mm. If we saw a band that, if, if you're on that list, you've sold your soul. Right. And I get to go backstage for that band. I get in free. I'm backstage. I get to take their drugs, drink their alcohol, and sleep with their groupies. And party with the band. If the band decides to move the party to the tour bus, I can do that. If they decide to go back to the hotel and keep the party going, I can do that. Yeah. But if their name's not on this list and I have to pay to get in to see them, then they didn't sell their soul. Mm. So the bands that I know that did not sell their soul, at least they didn't, the, yeah. the, you know, I could go see them for free. Um, you too. These are Bruce all Springsteen. These are or aren't. Not. They're not. Okay. They, they didn't sell their soul. Right. Okay. You too. Yeah. Um, Metallica. Yeah. And Pink Floyd. That's funny because I would have thought Pink yeah, Floyd made me extremely happy. Uh, it's funny because I, I expect Bono to. He's like for me, he's completely evil. You know, like you know, he's getting up to no good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost disappointed. I don't know why, but um, well, but, yeah. But generally speaking, though, would you say it's like know, by, by now? Yeah. By now, I mean he's been in the rock world for what almost forty years. Yeah. He got in what like eighty four, eighty two. You know he's part. He's part of the club. I, I, you know, in in some capacity. Um, but. Well, you know, most people are not are not completely innocent. Mm. You know, especially of a rock band, you're surrounded by oh, yeah. evil. And after a while, even if you didn't sign, mm. you're just influenced. Yeah. You know, and you're influenced in such a way that, you know, like in the Bible where, you know, it's like good is bad and bad is good and mm. upside down is right side up and black is white. You know, it's like after a while, you don't know what is the right answer. You don't know, are you still a good guy or not? Mm. You know, I pray for the salvation of David Gilmore every day because his music to me is outstandingly beautiful. And he's an atheist. Mm. You know, I need him to believe in God before he dies. Mm. I've even had masses said for David Gilmore. Mm. You know, I, I love his sound, his music, his voice. Yeah. Everything is just incredible. You know, and he's been doing it for about 60 years. So there are good, there are like just normal, regular guys and girls that get into bands and make it right but you're saying that there's also the more manufactured ones that have gone through this kind of illuminati black magic they've worked with a kind of a, a high wizard well, or something like that we, we had a an article came out on life site news hmm. uh, a couple of months ago and it was written by um i think it was by father rita he's an exorcist in tennessee and he wrote an article about nobody should allow their kids to go see Taylor Swift because she's doing magic spells on stage. And she's admitting being a witch. You know, and I told people 10 years ago, she's too innocent. She's going to go the way of Miley Cyrus and Britney Spears 
where she gets a good, solid audience base, fan base, because she's so innocent and yeah. naive. She's going to switch gears and show you what she's really like. Yeah, and they do. Don't, don't they? trust it. Yeah. You know, and people are like, oh, no, she's a good person. She wouldn't do that. As it knows, if she's famous, she's not a good person. You know, and people want to believe that their stars are holy and wholesome and nice and will never do that. Yeah, but some and like are, everybody. Right? Some, some are, though, right? Yeah, some are. Yeah. But it's so rare to find that. Yeah. You know, I shocked the world when I said I've seen Metallica four times. I had to pay all four times. They're just grassroots. Yeah, they were not on my list. They were not on my free list. And yeah, you know, it's like they're they're famous, but they didn't become famous. They didn't become rock stars until the black album. And they had out probably six albums before that. Right. They just didn't hit it big then. Right. Help me out with something then. Like how how would someone that can't dance suddenly be able to dance well? Like <laughs> Like that'd be a magic sport. Yeah, really. Well, they suddenly they're just like they kick. They're like a marionette, and so, suddenly they just know all the moves. I mean, how does that work? Um, it, it's a in their brain, something is switched on that tells them they can dance. Yeah, and then they're they're given uh, certain skills that just help them along. Plus, they're probably be given a demon that you know, like uh what's her beyonce? beyonce says that when she gets on stage she becomes possessed and her demon is called sasha fierce sasha what sorry sasha fierce is the name of her oh, demon wow so sasha comes out she's fearless she can do things that i cannot do when i'm in rehearsal i mean i can try but then it just doesn't happen. I can sing notes and sing strong and do all these things that when I'm just by myself, I can't do. And I remember right before I performed, I raised my hands up and it was kind of the first time I, I felt something else come into me. So do you, is an actual entity going into their bodies then, would you say most of these famous uh, singers, you know, that have been put through this? Yeah, I would say that there's um there's a video. I don't know who the artist is, but there's a video my daughter was telling me that you can watch a video of a famous singer that caused one of her audience members to get possessed. He did a spell over her oh. and she got possessed and you can watch it. Hmm. So yeah, I I, I helped about 1,200 rock stars sell their souls. 1,200? Um, yeah. So they're all famous, like, 12, like we're talking. Yeah. Practically every, every band that was out there between 87 and 99. Unless, like I said, unless you were already famous. And but if we, you're already famous, but they're not, are, you they're sold not, your soul to someone. But they're not just rock stars. They were talking pop stars as well, then, because it's not. There must be can't be that yeah. many. Yeah, yeah. Um, th there's pop stars, rock stars, heavy metal, death metal, uh, country music, um, opera. Uh, can we give pretty much every genre? Of music. Can, can we can we give any names? Like, what about Michael Jackson? Michael Jackson was scared of me. Right. He, he knew that I was, my position was satanic and he didn't want to have anything to do with it. Really? But I'm pretty sure that Wu-Town was involved with the High Wizard back, Wu -Tang. you know, in the early days. This is what, what you mean the whole genre? And That's then I... Is that what you're saying? Well, uh, the, with Motown itself, I'm sure that Motown was involved with High Wizards. Oh, Motown Records. Is that what you're referring to? Right. Yes. Right. Okay. Because yeah. the millions of dollars, millions of dollars flowed through Motown. 
you know, there's too much money there for the devil to ignore it. Could it be the case that the so, the record label producers, they do the spell, but the actual artist might not know anything about it? Uh, that is possible that there are um, Jewish rabbis yeah. that come into some of the studios and they practice magic and they would bless the master copy yeah. and the artist wouldn't know anything about it. There, there was a boy band uh, called Boy Zone and... Um... This guy Shane Lynch said he would turn up and they'll just be doing some kind of like black magic ritual whilst he was there in the meeting. I've been in rooms at the, the top of the top, which albums are prayed over demonically. Music is prayed over demonically. And um, that goes out to the world, goes out to the radio stations, goes out to the public. And when you see that stuff and know that stuff, it's frightening. What do you mean by that Shane prayed over demonically? Uh, rituals, ceremonies to give light to, to, to the devil, to Satan. It's, it's a satanic music industry. Chester Bennington and Chris Cornell were going to, you know, expose all this to the world. Yeah. And they both did suicide. You know, it's like mm. Chester Bennington, or not, uh, Chris Cornell was on tour. Mm. Like his whole life was mapped out for the next year. He had plans. And he committed suicide. It's like, come on. No. You know he didn't commit suicide. Do they just get killed? And, by, do they get and, killed by like a, a hitman? Or do you think they're just, they have like a heart, like a supernatural a force which makes them just have like a heart attack or something, you know, or whatever? I think it's like the Illuminati send somebody there. And, you know, I don't know if they give them a chance of like, hey, you know, if you promise not to yeah. do this, we'll let you live. Yeah. But or if by the time they're killed, they've been given all the chances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess they figured they were a public enough figure that nobody could touch them, and they found out they were wrong. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that one of them committed suicide. I think that they were murdered. Yeah, yeah. You know, in in the in this world, it's called being suicided out. Yeah, you know, it means you were murdered. But it looks like suicide. Yeah, Jeffrey Epstein. Right, right. Uh, which other pop star? You, Madonna must be right high, high priestess up there, is she not? <laughs> she, she was on, um, I think it was when she performed at the Super Bowl in the States. Yeah. Um, she was wearing uh, a witchcraft headdress. Yeah. And she was dressed as a witch. Yeah. You know, Taylor Swift and Katy Perry have both done witchcraft rituals on mm. the on stage yeah uh katie perry did dark horse when it first came out and it was on an awards show and if you watch the performance it's a witchcraft spell it's a ritual and, um, and none of it's done artistically some people it's, just not, don't. it's not just done to be edgy and artistic it's it's you think that's actually legitimately satanic um Nicki minaj a few years ago yeah. did a he had a priest come out on stage and give her an exorcism and she acted possessed hmm. was in an act who knows and you see sam smith he he dresses up like his song is unholy it's called and he's just like dressed in all these like devil horns and everything else some say it's just artistic but it, it just seems really off you know um well, you know, you have so many artists now that claim that they're satanic. Yeah. Or they claim that they're witches. Mm. You've got their fans saying, oh, they're just doing it to be funny. Mm. Like, no, I don't think they are. You don't I think they're serious. Yeah. Mm. I was going to say, so Mariah Carey, who's got this really high-pitched voice like a dolphin, She's probably yeah. she's probably had some multiple rituals done in her backside, then is she or not? There, there's been um, she's one of many that have had something like that done. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's just my mind's blown at this point. You know, it's just like. I, I, we we should really talk about how you then found 
God found Christ and found Catholicism, I think, to oh. we, 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 we I really want to stay uh, on because I really want to I love all this sort of stuff. You know what I mean? But I'm like, if we don't go into that, then it's like we haven't completed the journey in a way, have we? And we need to right, right. Start, kind of bring it around. But um, I think we should, you know, and I'm also conscious of time. I'm very grateful for your time as well. Um, do you want to move we it? Into, or, 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 yeah, close the circle. But what just quickly, what? So you then became a high wizard. You were integrated into the music industry, Hollywood as well, right? Probably helping actors as well, I'm guessing. Yeah, I, was the, I was the high wizard for 12 years. Yeah. And, you know, at one point, you know, I tell people in my talks, at one point I was worth $87 million. Mm. Now that's in my bank account. It's not really mine. I can't touch the money. But when I get to a new town, I buy a new house, I look like I'm worth $87 million. Mm -hmm. In my real account, I'm worth about $265. Mm -hmm. I wear an Armani suit. It's a tuxedo from the 1800s and a top hat. And I carry a cane because I thought a wand was hokey. Um, in my real life, I wear Metallica shirts, cut off jeans, and flip flops. <laughs> um, not now. When, this is when you're yeah. 18, isn't it? Yeah, I'm just like checking. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, we're in that this story. When, 21. When I was a wizard, when I was a wizard, I had 12 cars. My favorite car to drive was a Lamborghini Diablo. Oh, you had one. Um, but at the time, my my real car was a Nissan Sentra. Oh, right. okay. Um, I had. Uh, a condo in Texas, a condo in Atlanta, a condo in Manhattan, and a mansion in Calabasas. And my real house, I lived in Frenchtown in Tallahassee, Florida. Now, I know Frenchtown sounds like it's a nice place. Frenchtown is what they call the ghetto. So I live in the heart of the ghetto in Tallahassee, Florida. So I don't have any money. I, I don't have good clothes. I don't drive a nice car. I, I don't have anything. You know, Satan's just all about using your illusion. At some point, when you're driving your Lamborghini and realize, you know, this isn't my car. And I'm parking it in a 12-car garage in my mansion in Galabasas and realize, you know, this isn't really my house. And I'm looking at my bank account of $87 million that I can't spend, realizing this isn't really my money. And I'm going to have to go home pretty soon in the ghetto yeah. and drive my Nissan Sentra. This job isn't as much fun as I thought it would be. Why you wasn't know, it I got money? to travel? Sorry, can I just tell, why wasn't it your $87 million? Why couldn't you access that money? It belonged to my coven. Belonged so to my coven. Right. I, I'm I'm not allowed to use it. They can use it for whatever they want to use it for. I can't touch it. If I touch it, I'm stealing. Mm. So I can touch my own money and they pay all my bills. So it's not like I, I'm not benefiting from it. Mm. But I can't take go buy a new car. You know, I've got cars that I can borrow that I can look and point it to other people. But I can't drive this car to Frenchtown and leave it there. You know, I have to use it when I'm on site someplace else. So mm. after a while, you know, when you can send all you want, when you can send with impunity, it's not fun anymore. When I first started, I got to travel. I got to do magic. I got to party with rock stars. I got to do abortions once in a while. Now I have to travel. I have to do magic. I have to party with rock stars and I have to do abortions. And I'm tired of what I'm doing, what I'm seeing. It used to be fun. Now it's a job. I'm just not enjoying it like I used to. So I plot an escape. You know, I pull for money out of my own account because they watch my account too. So I can't just take out $200. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. I've got to wait and take out like ten dollars a week or twenty dollars a week, and just keep pilfering money until I have about two thousand dollars. And then I made a doctor's appointment at a satanic doctor. I made it for the five p.m. appointment on the last. It was the last appointment on a Friday, and I started driving that way. But I stayed on the interstate, didn't get off, mm-hmm. kept driving until my car ran out of gas, spent the night in my car, and hitchhiked to the next town, sold my car for scrap, got a Greyhound bus ticket to go into Canada. And when I got up there, I got rejected at the border. At that time, you didn't need a passport to get in, Mm. but they rejected me at the border. So uh, they told me they'd take me anywhere that Greyhound goes. So I opened up a United States atlas, closed my eyes, and just put my finger down, see where it landed. And it landed on Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I lived for one year off the grid, two years on the grid, bought a new car, tried to get it into Canada again, got rejected again at the border. Mm. And so I was going to drive back to Oklahoma And a friend called me and asked me what was going on. So I explained it. And he goes, oh, there's a border crossing near Burlington, Vermont, where you can just drive straight across. There's no border guard there. Okay, great. I'll go that way. So I'm about two hours away from that border crossing. And I got super tired and I couldn't stay awake any longer. So I pulled over at a rest stop to take a nap. Except when I took my nap, it was like, two o'clock in the afternoon. When I woke up, it was eight o'clock in the morning. So I'd slept all night. Oh, wow. oh not a problem. I'm still just two hours away. So I, you know, stretch, get back in the car and drive that way. Two hours later, I'm crossing the border and I get pulled over by a border guard. Mm-hmm. He searches my car inside and out, top to bottom, and is explaining to me that he's been trying to get this job for three years. And today is his very first day on the job. And I realized that God has got a sense of humor. Had I driven into Canada yesterday, I'd be safely in Canada right now. But because I fell asleep overnight, now I'm not getting into Canada. Mm. So I was worth $18 and then half a tank of gas. So I drove to Burlington, Vermont got involved in their homeless program and got a job my first day in town. And from that, I got a job in the mall. And from the mall, I worked at Finish Line, Sunglass Hut, and then this store called Piercing Pagoda. It's a jewelry store. Mm. And one night I did a magic spell. I did magic spells every night. I was addicted to magic. Right. And the next day I went into work. And I was a general manager, mm-hmm. and this uh, woman comes up, wants to buy a pair of gold hoop earrings, and I present her with, I think, the perfect pair. Well, I'm about to close the deal, and she goes, you know, actually, I'm shopping with my daughter. When I'm done, I'll come back and I'll buy these. All right? And most people that say that mean, I'm going to go find them cheaper someplace else. But she had an honest face. I knew she was coming back. And sure enough, she came back. It was three hours later, she came back. We did the transaction. At the end of the transaction, I'd say, if you call this 800 number and this receipt and take a survey, you might win $1,000. She goes, oh, that's fantastic. I've got something for you, too. And I'm thinking, oh, no. She's going to pull out a jack chick tablet, tell me that I'm sinning. And he dropped to my knees and begged for forgiveness. All this stuff that I can't do because I sold my soul to the devil when I was 13. Mm. But I know better than to tell these evangelical types that I sold my soul to the devil Mm. because they'll follow you home evangelizing to you. Mm. They will. (laughs) Sure that. So... I stick my hand out. Now she says the weirdest thing 
I've ever heard. She pulls out this little cheap colored gold piece of tin. Now, I sell fine jewelry. I recognize cheap. She says the weirdest thing I've ever heard. Now, remember, I partied with rock stars. You give somebody that can write songs and poetry unlimited booze and drugs, and they will say some strange stuff. Everything that she said was weirder than any rock star, any band, any song lyric I've ever heard. She said, the Blessed Mother is calling you into her army. Mm. And I thought, Blessed Mother, Isis, Gaia, I don't know who she's talking about. And then she said it's very powerful. Mm, not feeling that. You know, let's go back to I was the high wizard. Mm. You know, there's between two and five of us in the world, but that number could be as low as one or as high as ten. So that meant at one point I could have been the only one high wizard out of seven billion people. That's a power trip and a half. Mm -hmm. And she's trying to tell me that something's powerful. No, I doubt it. And then I just tune her out. I go to my happy place. And I'm just thinking about everything but her. And after a while, I notice she's still there. She's still talking to me. And I'm thinking, how do they all find me? There must be a sign above my head that says, crazy, come here. And only crazy people can see it. And they all find me. And I tune her back in because she has the goal to have her cash. This was win-win for both of us. Mm -hmm. Why is she still talking to me? And I tune her back in. She said, Done. it's very powerful. Now I feel like she's challenging me. That she's insulting me. I used to be the high wizard. This isn't powerful. Mm -hmm. This is cheap going gold colored piece of tin this can't do anything to me there's no power no mystique to this this is worthless i'm gonna take it in my hand i stick my hand out i'm gonna take it mm. i'm gonna take it in my hand i'm gonna feel of it i'm gonna know there's no power to it mm. i'm gonna toss it on the floor slam it on my counter mm. and i'm gonna tell her it's worthless mm. now if she wants to get mad and return the gold and get her money back that's fine and if she wants to call my manager, the regional vice president, and call and complain, she can do that. Because I made my day financially. I made my days, my weeks, my months, my quarter, and my year. My boss is never going to believe I was rude to somebody. She's going to think uh, she must not have not liked. She didn't like your tie. She didn't like your haircut. She didn't like your cologne. It wasn't you personally. It wasn't anything you did. Don't worry about it. Yeah, you're not going to be fired. So she's all ready to give it to me. My plans are I'm going to toss it on the floor, slam it on my counter, and tell her it's worthless because she had the gall to challenge me. That's how I viewed it. You're telling me it's powerful. I'm telling you it's garbage. I stick my hand out. She drops it in my hand. I clench my fist around it. All ready to tell her these things. Except that when I clench my fist around it, my store and my mall completely disappear. I'm standing in a darkened void. I can't see this woman, but I can hear her still talking to me. She tells me about the magic spell that I did last night, and that's of the devil. And she told me about, I've split over 100 churches, and that's of the devil. And I've committed over 100 assisted abortions, and that's of the devil. And she tells me about eight or nine other sins, and she ends everything with, and that's of the devil. Now, I am terrified of this woman. When this first happened, I wanted to attack her with magic. Mm. But now I realize if I attack her with magic, she'll destroy me. 
you know, let, let's go back to, I could have been the only one high wizard in 7 billion people. I did not have the magic power to transport me and somebody else with a worthless gold-colored piece of tin, miraculous metal, to a darkened void and know all their sins. Her magic is stronger than mine. Mm. And what happens if I go of the metal and I just fall through this darkened void and don't find my way back to the mall? What do I do then? I don't know what to do. And all of a sudden she says, again, the Blessed Mother is calling you into her army. And instantly, like a grace from God, I knew that was the Mother of God. A very strange revelation for a former Baptist. We'd rather shoot ourselves in the face with a shotgun than say Mother of God. And when I realized it was the Mother of God, Mary showed up. She smiled at me. It was a smile I knew I did not deserve. I was acutely aware of my 146 assisted abortions. And she took me by the hand, the hand that had the miraculous metal in it. And she turned me around. Divine Mercy Jesus was standing behind me. I didn't know what Divine Mercy was. I had no idea what that was. But I've got these rays of light going under me and over me, around me and through me. And in that instant, I knew I did not sell my soul to the devil when I was 13. I knew Jesus Christ was my Lord and Savior. I knew all my magic, my occult, my new age, my Satanism was false. And I knew everything Catholic was truth. And the Blessed Mother told me that my job was to help her end abortion. Mm. And when I opened my hands, I was back in my store, back in my mall. This woman's still talking to me. She tells me that her name is Marianne Wickman, and she's Father Joe Whalen's personal assistant with the St. Raphael Healing Oil Ministry. And she said he's the busiest priest that she knows, that he's so busy, he doesn't even have time to talk to her, and she's the personal assistant. While she's talking to me, her cell phone rings. She looks down. She goes, this is Father Joe. I've got to take this. I'm like, yeah, you just explained all that. Go ahead. So at that time, Father Joe was starting to go deaf. So he talked like everybody was starting to go deaf. So everything he said on the phone, I could hear it. Hmm. Now she answers the phone. She's like, Father Joe, what can I help you with? Can you hand the phone to the young man you're talking to? She's like, sure. So she hands me the phone. Now I'm shaking like Ozzy Osbourne. I'm like, hello? Welcome to the faith. Hand the phone back to Marianne. So I hand the phone back to Marianne. He hangs up on her. Her daughter comes up to the counter. And she, she said, would you bring this man one of each of everything from the truck? So she disappears. Hmm. Then we get two more phone calls that roll like the first one. And then the daughter comes in with a paper grocery bag with a bunch of pamphlets, why do Catholics do this or believe that, a Catholic Bible, and like 125 Lighthouse Catholic media discs. And then at the end of that day, I went home, and I'd been newly married for about three months, and I walked in the door. My wife had been a Jehovah's Witness and knew that that was a cult, so she no longer belonged. And but I, I walked in the door and I said, hey, honey, guess what? I'm Catholic now. It did not go over well. <laughs> but the next day, when I went to daily mass, she went with me. Mm. And at the consecration, I saw Jesus. And I thought, this is the greatest kept secret for me in the world. I mean, had I known that the Catholic Church legitimately had Jesus, I, I'd have gone to the Catholic Church as a young child and you couldn't have drugged me out. But I, I, I told, you know, my ex-wife, you know, I said, um, uh, do you see that? She goes, what? I said, that man up there on the stage. She goes, that's the priest. I said, no, the other guy. She goes, I, I don't see another guy. I went, huh, you don't see it because you're not Catholic. I thought 
I was instantly Catholic when they gave me that Blessed Miraculous Medal. And I thought everybody in that room was Catholic, saw Jesus up there. I didn't realize that I was the only one seeing it. Wow. And I found out there was a place called Perpetual Adoration where you could go see Jesus anytime you wanted. Mm-hmm. And I was like, is there a sign-up sheet for that? Do, do you have to like sign my name up and then they'll call me in like six months and tell me that there's an open slot and I can go and if I miss it, I won't be able to go for another six months. And they're like, no, 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 you just go there and, and, and attend. I was like, there's no line or anything. There's no line. And I'm thinking, no way. There's a line to see Elvis and he's been dead over 40 years. So we go. Shock number one, we're the only other car in the parking lot. Shock number two, there's no line to get in. Shock number three, the chapel is empty. It's me, my ex-wife, Jesus, and this woman. This woman looks up, stares at us for a minute, and then packs as fast as she can go. And then she says, you can't leave till someone else comes in. And bam, she's out the door. Mm -hmm. And I thought, why would I leave? I'm in a room with Jesus. You know, that became my regular hangout. I was there anywhere from 30 minutes to 18 hours a day. And that became my regular hangout. I ended up getting a deliverance by Monsignor LaValle, and he brought me into the church. My first um, spiritual director was Father Anthony Gramlich. He's the rector for the National Shrine of Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Um, I officially came into the church in May of 08. And I started All Saints Ministry in October 2010. Um, Since then, I've had approximately 210 interviews and I've also had approximately 210 uh, conferences. And, you know, being in this ministry this long, you know, it's been since 2010, now it's 2024. Yeah. But, you know, it allows me to travel the world yeah. and be on interesting shows and heal all people, around the world. You know. Like, like this one yeah well no thank, thank you, for, you very much yeah i mean me. i'm blessed i'm blessed to have you on and, and tell the story you know and it's absolutely incredible i mean you you've literally turned water into wine you've turned darkness into light you're you're now using your story to be able to i'm guessing this is is this like kind of healing are you able to sort of deliver other people is it like did you go through an exorcism well, yourself, and then you're able to like deliver other people now i went through a uh, deliverance yeah. Uh, my my priest, the priest that did the deliverance said that um he said whatever was with you mm. when Jesus and Mary showed up got the hell scared out of them. And he says that would have been better than any exorcism any priest could do. Mm. But but they still they performed the deliverance and I had satanic gifts at the time and the um Deliverance got rid of my satanic gifts. Um, what does that mean? I do, Sorry, does that mean you lost your magic, your black magic skills? Uh, I actually, I probably still have my my black magic skills. Mm. I just choose not to use them. But did it sort of change anything within you, your abilities? Like, did it, by moving into the light more, did it mean that the power had gone a little bit from that dark side? I have no temptation to do magic. I have no want, no desire. There's nothing that magic can do for me that Satan would tempt me with Hmm. that God couldn't outdo by a million percent more. Hmm. You know, it's and the one of the abilities I had is that I could see demons and angels. Mm. But back when I could see them, I thought, 
the demons were there to keep me safe and the angels were there to do me harm. When I became Catholic, I realized that the angels were there to keep me safe and the demons were there to keep me damned. Yeah, and it's it's changed over time. Mm. You know, when I first got deliverance, it completely went away. Right. Um, you know, now I have the ability, I can sense holy people and I can sense unholy people. Mm. I work with a lot of exorcists. The last exorcism I, I helped on was, honey, but huh? how long ago was the last exorcism I helped on? So it was either November or December, and they were exercising somebody, and they needed to know why they were going through it yeah. and what the demon's name was. So I was able to tell them why they were going through it. Right. And then I usually get a lot of my answers at either adoration or mass. And so I went, I had the opportunity to go to mass, but not adoration. So I went to mass and I talked to Jesus and Jesus gave me the name of the demon. And so I called one of the exorcists, there were three exorcists working. I called one of them and I gave him the demon's name. And so he texted the other exorcist. And when the exorcist was in there, the demon manifested and they bound it and found out that I was right with what the, the demon's name was. Mm. You know, so it, it's, it's joyful to me to be able to help out in that way. Mm. You know, and I'm only able to help because I used to be the high wizard and I used to work with demons. You know, if you could tell me the class of demon, I can tell you most likely what their name is. You know, and because I had worked at Bohemian Grove and I had worked there for 12 years, that I was able to ascertain the, the name of the demon. You were at Bohemian Grove, so where, like, what, so where they had the rituals, you know, in the owl. Yes. What, what goes on there then? Is it just the killing of a child? Uh, it's a mock sacrifice of a child. They don't really kill the child. I imagine back before we had social media like we do, mm. there probably were some children killed there. Currently, they they do a mock effigy. So it's uh, sticks and twigs shoved into the clothes of a man, and then they throw it in a bonfire or catch it on fire. Mm. And then uh, the child has electrodes hooked up to their testicles, and they're shocked really bad. And when they're shocked, they let out a scream. And the child has been promised ice cream, so he's willing to go through whatever to get ice cream. And I imagine because he doesn't realize how bad that's going to hurt. And um, a child doesn't die, but there's a lot of gay stuff that happens there. A lot of homosexuality. Um, there's a field where they'll announce orgy in the field and it's a bunch of gay men having sex, but anybody's allowed to join in. Mm. And there's only men allowed there. The cremation of care is one event. Uh, the event lasts about 18 days. Uh, cremation of care is one of the nights. You know, there's a lot of um, barbecues, um, a lot of beer drank there. At an all men only event. So this is like a festival. It's like an it's like a festival, like an eighteen day <laughs> festival. And so, is this like anyone can go, or is this like world leaders, like politicians, or just a mixture of secret society members? Or you have to be you have to be invited. Hmm. Now, a lot of people get invited, though. You know, you could find five thousand people there. Yeah. You know, and there's a lot of politicians. If you're a politician and you haven't been invited, you probably know somebody that's been before. If you know somebody that's an active member, they can get you permission to go there. 
And what do they get from it? Just pleasured, like just a party or, or is actually there something that happens where they're propelled? Is it like a networking club when they just get to meet people and they can help each other out? Or is there something supernatural where they get actually get propelled into the, something? The majority of it, the majority of it is rubbing elbows with yeah. somebody else important and, you know, opening up opportunities for yourself. But the high wizard walks the entire grounds for most of that time and is put in contact with people that want spells from him. Mm -hmm. So I got a lot of my work there. Mm. A lot of my work for the year would happen there. Mm. You know, I would have 40 or 50 people want to hire me which I give them a business card and they call this number and they talk to the Illuminati mm -hmm. and the Illuminati comes up with a price and then they have to come up with that price. Just to kind of thank you, but by the way, thank you so much for your time. And um, yes, yeah, one of the most, it's like absolutely mind blowing what you're telling me, but it's so important as well. And it's really unraveling what goes on in this kind of, when you scratch the surface, this dark, it's like an occultocracy that lies beneath the surface of society that we don't really know about. It's all kind of coming out. You're starting to see it coming out more and more, but like you're going a long way to really help this. And the thing that I, re I really love is that you say that um, abortion is a satanic, it's a satanic ritual that goes that everywhere, right? All abortion. Oh, yeah. And it doesn't matter the intention of the mom, of the mom. Yeah. It, because... You know, there are um, there are Satanists that are in every time zone, and from midnight to three, they do an extended black mass, mm. and they consecrate all the abortions of the day in their time zone mm. to Satan and the Antichrist. That's every day. And it doesn't matter if you got the abortion because your mom was going to kick you out of the house, or if you got the abortion because your husband was going to leave you. Or if you got the abortion because you can't afford to have a child, mm. or you got an abortion because you're going to be kicked out of school, mm. none of those reasons matter. If you get the abortion, that abortion is going to be consecrated to Satan and the Antichrist. You know, that's every single abortion. And in Planned Parenthood, that's 1,500 abortions a year. Per abortion mill. 1,500 a year. Yeah. It's more than 1,500, isn't it? Abortions a year. Well, it's, it's 1,500 a year per abortion mill. Per, what's a mill? There's, 800, uh, there's 865 Planned Parenthoods in the United States. Right, okay. So 865 times 1,500 is the 1. 1.3 million. Yeah. Also, exorcists say that for every abortion that's committed, a demon gets released from hell. Oh, wow. So Planned Parenthood is releasing 1.3 million demons from hell every year. And where do they go? Here. Yeah, but do they attach to people or like what? They float around, we can't see them and influencing or what? Well, I would imagine that that a lot of them attach to the women that are getting the abortion. Right. Yeah. Now, have you ever seen those people when they, when they come out and they protest you know, and they, they want abortion to stay legal? They look oh, mean. They, they're absolutely, they like they're, they're just not, they're not, they're almost not human, you know? Yeah. Right. Mm. You've got some guy on the sidewalk praying his rosary silently not bothering anybody. And you've got this woman that just had an abortion running up, beating him up. I know. And it's like, what, what did he do to you? Yeah. It's like, why are you assaulting this man? You're sending this man to, to a hospital. We had a guy that was attacked um, about the middle of last year. He was elderly. Mm. And he was beaten so bad that they broke, I think, his skull 
and his eye socket. Hmm. And he had to go to the emergency room. I think they broke his ribs also. And he was beat up by like two or three young people. Hmm. And it's on film. Because he's on was film like, and they never arrested the people that did it. Because he was against the abortion, right? Yeah. Yeah. He was standing out in front of an abortion mill praying a road. Yeah. It's amazing how they are like how angry they get if you're just opposed if you just want to protect a baby's life, they get like they just become possessed. I'll show I'll put a video into the edit where people can see, but there's a woman and she's literally screaming like My choice! My choice! My choice! My choice! My choice! My It's like it's just not even human. I just you know, it just absolutely flips, switches. It's just something not right there. Right. Yeah. But it there's other things like that. It's when you tell people that yoga is satanic suddenly you're the bad guy you're evil it's I've just advert it's just exercise it's totally harmless you all right know, explain like, that one you're gonna have to accept because so the yoga the positions are satanic poses are they not is that is that i've heard that before they're they're, they're satanic they're poses of, of demons you know like i used to do my talks and i would say how many people are willing to do an exercise now let me tell you what it's good for it'll cure migraines arthritis fibromyalgia drug addictions pornography addictions alcoholism mm. uh, body pains aches mm. uh, you feel younger it'll cure disease who wants to do that and everybody raises their hand and i said okay all you have to do is pay homage to a demon Hold the demonic pose. Who's willing to do it now? And all the hands come down. I said, none of you guys want to do that? And they're like, no, no, no. I said, but you all told me you practice yoga. That's the exercise I just described. Um, St. Pope John Paul II wrote a paper called Jesus Christ, the Water Bearer of Life. Now, it's at the Vatican website. But theirs has all the spaces added into it. So if you print it, it's 70-something pages long. Mm. If you go to my website, allsaintsministry.org, mm. we took out the spaces. So it's like a 40-something page document. Yeah, It tells you 20 practices that no Christian can do. And one of them is yoga. And it's because you're holding positions of demons. And a lot of people get possessed that practice yoga. A lot of exorcisms I've been involved in, we found out it was because they practice yoga. That's how they got possessed. Just by doing the poses. Just by doing the poses. I, I did now, a hot, I did want... a hot I did a hot Bikram yoga and um I got like sleep issues straight after that, like that evening where I was like got like spasming, you know, and it went on for months. I'm wondering if it's connected to that, the yoga. Uh, yeah, you should have just had a deliverance done. Yeah. Mm. But um, now, see, there's some priests and some nuns that practice yoga and don't believe there's anything wrong with it. Mm -hmm. But we have a saint in the Catholic Church that says no Christian can do it. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, and we have, I, I work with a lot of exorcists. And, Sometimes the priest can't figure out how they got possessed. And when I ask all my questions, I find out that they practice yoga. Or Reiki is another one. Oh, Reiki. You can't practice Reiki. You know, the Reiki mm. is when the person becomes a Reiki master, they have magic symbols drawn on their body and they're given a spirit guide. What do you think a spirit guide is? Mm. Yeah, a demon, probably. It's a demon. Yeah. yeah it's a demon. Mm. And then not every person they work with gets possessed, but enough that we can tell you don't do this. Are there no good spirit you know, guides then? Uh, Are there no like good angels, like good, you yeah. know? 
Yeah, there, only two thirds of the angels didn't fall. Only one third fell. But they don't attach to exercises and make you do crazy, weird stuff. God doesn't use magic. Mm. How would you know when you're possessed then? Um, signs of possession. Suddenly you are speaking a language you have never studied. Mm. Uh, we had a guy in a church that came into the church wearing work boots, had mud and grass on his pants, and a cowboy hat. Didn't take it off to come into the church. Mm. Looked like I don't know what you'd call it over there. Over here, we call it a redneck. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uneducated. Yeah. Just has a, a high school diploma. Mm. Yeah. But he, he spoke fluent Aramaic. Right. And Latin. And a bunch of European languages as well. Just came to him. And you know that he was not. He didn't learn this in school. Right. Also hidden. Knowledge. Like, if I just met you, mm. but I could tell you what your parents did on their first date, no matter what it was. Yeah. Whether they send or not, I know the details of your parents' first date without ever meeting them. That's called hidden knowledge. Mm. Now we have a a godly gift that's similar. It's called word of knowledge. And that's when the Holy Spirit tells you something. But why would the Holy Spirit tell me something about your parents' first date? Mm -hmm. So you have that. You have uh, aversion to holy objects. You have manifesting, which manifesting a lot of times is your face distorts. Your eyes may get bigger or smaller. They may change color. They may go completely black or completely white. Um, your body might distort. There was um, a, a priest called me from Africa, and he told me that he did something in his church. He didn't know if he did the right thing. And he exercised somebody, and he didn't know if he did the right thing or not. And so he called a bunch of priests and they told him to call me and they gave me, gave him my website. And he said, get the phone number off that site and call him. So this guy calls me and tells me he exercised somebody. I said, well, what did you see? Had you know he was possessed? Hmm. And he says, I was getting the, the church ready for mass and the church doesn't have four walls. It has a ceiling, a thatch ceiling and a pole going up through the middle. And it's open air, and all these people are coming from all over the country in Africa to go to Mass. And somebody screams, and he looks up and sees this man walking in. The man's laying on his back. His hands are stretched out, mm. and his hands are down where his feet should be. His legs are bent backwards, and his feet are up by his shoulders. And this is how he's walking. He's on his hands and his feet on his back, mm. walking like that. I've seen uh... this guy grabs grabs the picks with Jesus out of the monstrance and charges after this man with Jesus out in front of him. And he yells, Jesus Christ commands you to get out of his church. Mm. And suddenly this guy's body unwraps. And he curls up in the fetal position and sobs. So the priest starts hearing everybody's confession. Here's everybody's confession, including that guy's. And then they did the mass. And then everybody came up and took the Eucharist. You know, he said, did I do the right thing? And I said, well, it depends on if your bishop is the kind of man that says, 
you have to call me before every single exorcism and get my permission. Or if your bishop realizes that it's hard to get a hold of somebody in, in Africa and it's okay to do the exorcism and then call him, what mm -hmm. kind of bishop do you have? And he was silent for a minute and he said, I am the bishop. Mm. And I said, oh, then you did the right thing. I said, what, what kind of bishop are you anyway? Which way do you go? Mm. He says, I, I tell my people to just do the exorcism and mm. then I'll give you permission afterwards. Yeah. And I said, you didn't know that you're allowed because since you're the bishop, you're the exorcist. Mm. And he says, no manual comes with this job. <laughs> you just learn as you go. Yeah. Yeah. No. Also, uh, levitation. Somebody that can levitate. I had somebody that, um, mm. kid was uh, 19 years old. Yeah. And his mother would bless his doorway every day with yeah. the sign of the cross, you know, the, either holy water or holy oil. Mm. And he would come home and he would punch the door in that spot, even though it's dry. Mm. And one day she put holy oil all around the frame of the door. And it's a storm door. It goes on the outside of the house. Mm -hmm. And this kid came home, grabbed the door, yanked it off the hinges, and then bent the door in half. Oh, my God. It, that door is supposed to withstand like a 165 mile an hour wind. Mm -hmm. So then he goes in the, in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. now, at this time, I'm there. And I walk in the room behind him. He's staring at a St. Benedict crucifix on his wall. He's not touching it. He's staring at it. And the St. Benedict medal pops out of it. And then he levitates about a foot off the ground and moves out of the bedroom, down the hall, into the living room, and then floats up till he runs into the joist between the ceiling and the wall. And then he falls and hits the floor and he's asleep. And the next day, his mom had to go to work. So she's at work and she calls me at the hotel and says, my son just went to jail. Uh, he was outside watering the flowers naked and they call the police on him. And so they took him to the mental hospital so they could assess him, see what was wrong with him. Mm. So she called the exorcist. The exorcist there, this is in New Jersey. The exorcist doesn't believe that people that say they're possessed, he thinks they're all schizophrenic. Mm. And so he showed up to see her son. And she said, they won't let me in, but they said you could go in. So he went back in there to see her or to see him. Five minutes later, he runs out. His hair is matted, his face is flush, he's covered in sweat, and he yells at her, your son is schizophrenic, and runs away. Mm. And I thought, that doesn't sound like he saw schizophrenia. That sounded like he saw possession mm. and couldn't explain it. And um, he would never exercise her son. He didn't believe in it. Mm. Were you were you slightly jealous of the levitation? Because <laughs> you remember you said you were a kid, you always wanted to levitate. I could levitate as I was. You could. Yeah. Oh wow. What there's a spell for that, or you could just instantly do it whenever you want and float around. Uh, there's a spell for it, but there's a demon that does it. Mm. A demon lifts you up. Right. Yeah, so you you had the possession. You had that demon in you then. You did. Well, I, I didn't get possessed for that. I had the demon literally lifts you up. Right. Mm. So you can feel yourself being lifted. Mm -hmm. Now, no one else notices that's how you're doing it. They think it's a power that you have. Mm. You know, they don't realize that you're controlling a demon. But, you know, when I was at 
Well, I was really high up in the air. If he'd have dropped me, I'd have died. Really, that high? And um, at one of my heights, I went up 300 feet at one time, but usually I would stay around 100 feet. I just did it for show, just to show everybody that I could do it. At 300 feet, I was really scared, mm. but I was trying not to show with fear. What, and then it, you you slowly come down or what? This is like Mary Poppins or something. <laughs> yeah, you slowly come down. <laughs> yeah. And you did this and at you, what, like you go Bohemian up, Grove? You go up in a, in a big circle. Right. You, like kind of a course through up, and then you come down in the same way. But you wouldn't do this in public. You'd do this in like specific places like Bohemian Grove, right? Where there's, yeah. This would be at like a satanic convention. Yeah, okay. And are people not like, wow, or are they just like, okay? Oh, you know, they already know who the High Wizard is. Right, okay. They don't know which Wizard is performing, but they know one of the High Wizards. And if you're the High Wizard, you know, you're going to pull out all the stops and do the Try and do the best magic show they've ever seen. Wow. Did you see any shape shifting? Yeah, I've seen Native Americans do that. Hmm. I was at um, a Native American, it was like, a, I can't think of what the event was called, hmm. but it was a bunch of shaman that together. And there was this guy there that started running across a field. And it started off as a human being running across a field. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly it's a wolf. He was a giant wolf running across the field. Uh, there was another time I saw it and the man turned into a bear. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy that climbed a tree, got up to the top of it. And it was a very tall tree. He got up there and he jumped out of the tree. This was the first time I went, and I, I thought, oh, he's committing suicide. And he was almost to the ground, and he turned into an eagle and took off flying. Wow. And the first time I went, I thought, that's when I saw the wolf and the, the eagle. And I thought, I'm hallucinating. Mm. I've done a lot of drugs in my life. Mm. I made sure I didn't eat anything when I was there because I was told, well, don't eat anything. You're liable to be drugged. Mm. But you have to take off your shoes and walk around. And so I had my shoes off and I thought, maybe they treated the grass. And so everybody is hallucinating and seeing the same thing. Mm. So the next time I went, I wore gloves and I wore boots. And I wouldn't take anything off. But I saw the bear, you know, and I was like, oh, you still see this stuff. So I'm guessing I'm really seeing this. It's not a hallucination. And others saw it as well, I guess. So, Well, there's a lot of stuff that happens there. There's a sweat lodge. Yeah. Uh, you can also do, uh, you take a peyote button. And then you drink some kind of fluid to go with that. Mm. And then you hallucinate. And whatever you hallucinate, whatever you see in your hallucination, you tell it to somebody and they translate which, what happened to you, where you went, mm. or who your spirit guide is, what spirit guide showed up for you. And since you don't know what's real and what's not when you do that, mm. I didn't want to do it. Mm. Yeah. By the way, we've done three hours already. It's just time flies by. Thank you very much, by the way. Um, You're welcome. Really enjoy it. I've got, as you know, I'm so really interested in this, really curious. That's why I'm just like, you know, I thought maybe do an hour, but we've done three longest I've ever done. But I'll let me wrap up because I think um, this is probably a good time. But uh, yeah, can yeah, you probably. can you mention your website? Anybody, Sorry. Yeah, if anybody wants to um, see more of what I'm about, yeah, 
I have a website, I have a YouTube channel, I have a Spotify account. So I've got right now about 160 podcasts up. Mm-hmm. Um, my website is allsaintsministry.org. Um, you know, I also have my email address is listed there and my phone number is there and I have a WhatsApp. So if anybody wants to call me, you have questions or you want to email me, you know, I'm here to help whatever you need. You know, I'm here to help. 